This guy was born to ride a bike, there's no two ways about it. He's a special and unique person and athlete. I don't actually see Brad as a pursuiter, I actually see him as a racing animal. He was someone who saw what he wanted and he went for it. He clearly had the gift of speed. He just looked unnatural when you sat him on the bike. He was classy. The guy was born with a gift. But what he's achieved already is legendary status. If he commits to a race, you're going to get 100% out of him. He won't want to let people down. That's the only pressure he will feel. He'd chew his bloody handlebars off to finish a race. The man in black, Bradley Wiggins. So far this season, he has never put a wheel out of place. He's now licking his lips. He said, bring it on. I want to start this Tour de France. Well, now he's about to do just that. Bradley Wiggins has been winning for as long as he's been on a bike. A decade of endeavour has brought him a string of major honours. World championships, Olympic gold medals, leaders' jerseys in grand tours. But on the last day of June this year, he rolled down the start ramp in Liège and into the greatest challenge a rider can ever face, the Tour de France. This year, the famous race began in Belgium, as did Wiggins' story itself. He was born in Ghent, the son of a cyclist. Wiggins' father, Gary, was an Australian pro, plying his trade in Europe. Gary came over here in 1974. We used to, we were both um, riders race on the track, and we, we used to go to races together. He was a good rider, determined man. Gary was, was a bit heavier built than, than Bradley, a big, strong guy. <laughs> yeah, I think his mum, quite like cycling as well from an early age because um, that's how she met that's how she met Gary was at Paddington track she was there standing around the edge and obviously Gary must have she must have caught Gary's eye you know Gary's a good bike rider good you know um, good quick Kermes type rider but you know very good on the boards you know and um, yeah, rode, rode the Sixers and, you know, used to come back to Australia and rode all the big Madisons and Six Days in Australia and everything else. But, yeah, very handy bike rider. But, you know, like most of us, never in the class of Bradley. He was about less than two weeks old when I first met him, held him in my arms. Yeah. I never imagined. I don't think any of us did at that point, you know, that we would be holding or looking at a future Tour de France winner. He wants to win the prologue if he can, because it's a psychological slap in the face to everybody else. He's got a very aggressive, a low-profile position there. I don't think in recent years I've ever seen anybody come out perfectly in their preparation for the Tour de France. He was just two years old when his mother, Linda, moved back to London. Her marriage to Gary had fallen apart, but she didn't turn her back on the sport, and from a young age, she successfully nurtured Wiggins' growing obsession with cycling. You know, I was a big football fan as a kid, as mo you know, as most kids are, grow up in London, council estates, there's not much else to do other than kick a ball around. Um, but obviously I had this thing when my dad was a pro, so I, the cycling was there in the family and, and that's where that spark started for me. And once I fell in love with the sport, that was it for me then, it was buying cycling weekly every Thursday, reading, trawling for all the results in Europe and and that was the only way, you know, we didn't, Eurosport didn't cover cycling when I was a kid, you didn't have Twitter, you didn't have the internet. So the only way was getting on WH Smith and Kilburn on a Thursday and picking up Cycling Weekly and looking at all these great photos, cutting them up, sticking them on my wall, and dreaming one day maybe that I could do that. That was what it was about really, and that's what I fell in love with. Other kids had pictures of Gary Lineker and Paul Gascoigne and that, and I had Miguel Indurain and Johan Museo, and that, they were my, you know, heroes. So it was, um, I, mean, I think there was one of Tony Daw at some point. But uh, they were my, uh, yeah, they were my sporting heroes as a 12, 11, 12 year old, you know, and um, yeah, so it was, that's what it was all about. He told me that when he used to live on the estate in Kilburn, that he was very keen on football and he wanted to be a footballer. 
he was always out kicking around with the kids there, but then he realised they were getting in trouble and he didn't want to get in trouble and um, took to the bike. In later years, when I went and worked at the Ghent Six Day with him, I overheard him talking to a reporter and saying, probably one of the most significant wins of my career so far. At that time, he was a world champion. So afterwards, I said to him, what's all that significant win? And he said, listen, this cabin that we've been sitting in for the past six days at trackside was probably my first memory from cycling. He said, I remember being in a cabin, it might have even been this cabin, with the smell of embrocation and uh, all the razzmatazz of the six-day circuit watching his father race. But then I thought, well, I think you were about two then. He said, yeah, but that's what I remember. Third overall in the Tour of the Algarve in the early part of the season. He went on in March to win Paris-Nice. A month later, he was the winner of the Tour of Romandy. Two months after that, he was the winner of the Criterium de Dauphiné. But it's all been about building up for this month. That's all he's dedicated his season to. What sort of kid was he? Small, ginger, a little bit chubby. Um, always had an Archer Road Club top on and can remember him sitting up in the grandstand over there at the back, very quiet, a little bit away, a bit shy. I think a lot of cyclists are like that, sort of shy in a way. Um, you know, I think that we tend to express ourselves on the bike. In the very track centre here, young Bradley Wiggins used to come and play bicycle polo on a Saturday lunchtime. I mean, I was always here, but I wasn't training. I was up in the old grandstand there having a bacon bunty. And then getting the polo bikes ready. So a lot of the boys, when they'd finished their track training, they'd come in the centre and have bicycle polo. He was pretty adept, you know. I mean, many of them said it, it taught them a lot of their bike handling skills for the track, because in polo you could lean on riders and knock them about. Always looked like he was a bike rider. Always looked immaculate. His kit was immaculate. His bike was immaculate and it just, it just looked unnatural when you sat him on the bike. Wiggins has just gone through the check in 10th place, but six seconds slower than Sylvain Chavanel's. That's a bit of a shocker for this man, but he again is better suited to the long individual time trial. 10th place looking for six seconds. Brad was about 14 or 15 years old. I met him here at Herne Hill. He clearly had the gift of speed. With, with very little effort and uh, he was very fluid, he was very smooth, nothing was wasted. Um, everything actually went into making the bike go faster. He'd be, be relaxed in his upper body even when he was making big efforts and, and riding really fast. And clearly they need to be blessed with genes, which Brad clearly was. Clearly they want to want it and Brad clearly wanted it but they also need to be clever. He, he did have that as well, and I think those three are almost a guarantee of success. He saw himself as a pro, and he acted like a pro, even at that stage, and in fact, it wasn't an act. That, that, was, that was how he was. And he was classy. I mean, I've been racing since I was 12, and it was just about racing as a kid, you know, racing crits here, there, and everywhere. So, and, and that was what it was all about, racing. Um, so from it, it's not like I started doing time trials, as a lot of you know, Chris Borman, et cetera, did. So it was always about just racing your bike and enjoying racing and tactics and trying to win a sprint at the end. And so that's where that all started. And I've kind of regained that a bit the last few years. Bradley Wiggins has actually picked up over the latter part of this course. And look at this time. It's going to be very, very close indeed as well, he comes around inside the 150 to go. If he has lifted it, he was six seconds off the pace at the check. And now 7.20 is the record. Surely he is going to go inside the time here. Wiggins hits the line now. He is in first place. 52.3 kilometres an hour. Is he going to win it, Morris? Bradley? Yeah. Yeah, he's going to win. Let's hope so. It's, um... What can stop him? <sighs> well, you know, I think... I think the only person who can stop him is himself.
By 1995, Bradley Wiggins was a schoolboy champion and he continued to win races at junior level. His talent was obvious and he had the swagger to go with it, but there was another side to him too. Approaching his first junior world track finals in 1998, he was plagued by self-doubt. He was getting the collie wobbles the evening before the final of the World Championship, Junior World Championship pursuit in Cuba. And he said, do you think I can do it, Sean? And I just smiled and I said to him, if your opponent knew what I know, he won't be able to get out the toilet this morning. Wiggins had instilled the fear and took full advantage. He rode out his first ever World Pursuit Gold. That year he swept up four national titles as well. His march to the very top of his sport had begun. Others took note. I think my first sighting of Brad was probably in this building itself for national championships. And the first recollection of racing with him itself was probably Commonwealth Games 98 in Kuala Lumpur. He was still a junior, he'd just come back actually from winning his first world title, junior pursuit title. I think back then we were all big kids the pranks, the practical jokes. He was of that age where he, he took that on board quite well and we, you know, he gave as good as he got, that's for sure. He looked the part, he rode the track well and despite the fact that he was a youngster, he was already showing skills that you would associate with somebody probably uh, senior to his age. He pretty much knew what, or he thought he knew what he wanted and he had a vision of, of what it was. Already had his entourage with him and uh, he, he basically turned up. He was a fully fledged professional living the life then and uh, that's, how, that's how he's continued pretty much through his bike riding. Bradley Wiggins of Great Britain, the 23 year old starting in the home straight, trying to nail his first senior crown. Everything seemed to be set fair for a seamless transition to senior level and a successful career, but it wasn't that simple. Those old worries had never gone away. Self-doubt and ruthless self-criticism were never far beneath the surface. Unsure that he would ever make it, Wiggins began to think his future might lie away from the track. Brad was quite an emotional character in his formative years, shall we say. Peter Keane, the director of British Cycling at the time, phoned me up. And I wasn't involved with British Cycling and said, having a few issues with this, uh, this lad, uh, he seems to have got so close to being a, a, a world champion and then decide he's going to go and work with somebody in France. Will you come and have a word with him? Because he wants to do what you did. Uh, you might have some more influence. So uh, I did. Well, it's 0.4 of a second now. The Great Britain rider is under pressure. So all I did is ask him questions about, get him to question himself as to why he'd made that move, why he decided to suddenly change direction when I'd see it as being very successful, but I think he saw it as failed because he hadn't become world champion. Um, and only through a process of just talking, really, he let me in. He, uh, he realised that I've actually got most of the ingredients in the direction I was going with the people I was with, and I'm only such a short distance away, I'll stick with it. And now it's only 0.07 of a second. Wiggins relishing the four of becoming the world champion. He knows that rainbow jersey's going to be his. He's dreamt of being a world champion ever since he was a youngster. As far as this kid's concerned, you could do anything. You know, you go that fast on a bike, and what you've got to remember is the one thing in any walk of life, you know, is speed. And if you've got speed, it'll kill off your opponent. Whether it's far, you're faster going uphill to the other guy or faster on the flat, but one thing, Brad has tons of speed. And, you know, he goes across the ground quicker than most. And I think that's always been. But getting him to believe that is not always easy. Here comes Bradley Wiggins. What a performance by him. He's coming up to the line now. There it is, Bradley Wiggins. He's the world champion. 4.18 the time. His first senior world title. The proof's in the pudding there, you know. He showed the pedigree young, but he's carried it through, whereas a lot of junior world champions these days fall by the wayside. But this guy was special. There was no two ways about it. This is Bradley Wiggins chasing his second world 4,000 metre individual pursuit title. I find him a very compelling uh, person to watch and to listen to because there's clearly a massive amount going on in his head that isn't necessarily coming out of his mouth. All I wanted Bradley to do really was to think and question his own motives for the decisions that he was making um, and he was astute enough to do that. Look at this, it's over half a second already and we've only completed 1,000 metres. 
I don't actually see Brad as a pursuiter. I actually see him as a racing animal. A very clever racing animal. Bradley Wiggins of Great Britain really does look in superb style. He's chasing the second rainbow jersey for the individual pursuit. If he commits to a race and to an event, you, you pretty much know you're going to get 100% out of him. Well, look at Bradley Wiggins here. He's about to make the catch, and the German, Robert Bartko, has got no answer to it. Wiggins overhauls Bartko to win his second World Individual Pursuit title. What a display of speed and confidence there, and he salutes the crowd. It was a phenomenal ride. On a world stage, when you're in the shop window of a velodrome at a World Championships, Commonwealth Games, or an Olympic Games, if he's on the track, he will give all he can. Glorious Olympics for Bradley Wiggins here. Bradley Wiggins up to the line. He's the Olympic champion. He seals the gold medal. Team GB do it again. It is a stunning. Glorious Olympics for Bradley Wiggins here in Athens. It's been another golden, glorious day at the Velodrome. Here in Beijing, the gold medal for Bradley Wiggins takes his challenge. He's unstoppable. He's entering into the realms of sporting immortality. Five gold medals at the World Track Championships were one thing, but it was a success at consecutive Olympic Games, a gold medal in Athens and two in Beijing, which suddenly propelled him into the limelight. Gold after gold after gold for TGB. Uh, Bradley's with us uh, this morning, uh, together with his uh, two gold medals. It's funny, Egypt's like us, everybody wants to touch it. I'm sure everywhere you go, people want to touch it. You're quite, I mean, the moment, obviously fantastic, but afterwards, are you quite cool about it? Or? Um, I, for me, it was just like a huge relief, I think, more than anything. You, know, you spend four years working for this, as we all did, and, and it's kind of just sort of summed up in this one medal afterwards, and, and it's something you know, not everyone gets to have and mm. you can take it home and what an incentive for us now to, to do it all again in London, yeah. just up the road here, you know, and it's, uh, for, for me growing up in London as a kid, I never imagined one day I'll get to ride Olympic Games here in the prime of my career, yeah. you know, so it's really kind of... And is that the prime? Because you're 28 28 now. now. Another two games of me yet. Despite a string of titles and serial success stretching over a decade, Wiggins wrestled continually with the austere lifestyle of the cyclist. After his gold medal in Athens, he embarked on his own booze-filled nine-month sabbatical. It was GB Cycling, headed by Dave Brailsford, who pointed to the way out, and once again he leant heavily on certain trusted figures. With Bradley, after Athens, he did have a dive, and Bradley did come to see me. He started asking questions. And I think then it sort of like gave him this uh, feeling that maybe this wasn't about, oh, this guy deals with crazy people. This was a guy who was saying, do you understand how your emotions and mind are working? So then he became intrigued. He was very open. And again, in this remit, my job is to get somebody where they want to be. So I'm asking, what is it that's happening in your life at the moment? He would then go through this with me and say, these are the things that are bothering me or are troubling me. This is where I'd like to be from a practical point of view and an emotional point of view. And then my job is to work out what's stopping him getting there. It's a teamwork between the athlete and myself. Uh, and as a team, we work out where we're going to go. Now, I've always described Bradley as a tiger. When he's ready, he'll appear from nowhere out the jungle. You know, I feed him. Uh, he knows what he wants. He knows what he's after. He'll explain to me. Um, we do the work together, and then he disappears into the jungle. I have no idea when he'll return. He might come back within two days. It might be two months. Um, when Bradley's ready, he picks the phone up. And we have an agreement that if he's in any kind of difficulty or wants any advice or wants some um, skills base to be improved, he will get in touch, and he does that. Young, a little cocksure, and sometimes errant, it fell to Dave Brailsford's GB Cycling to focus his energies. He assembled a core of three coaches, Chris Boardman, Steve Peters, and Shane Sutton. These men were charged with cutting the Wiggins' rough diamond. But it was Sutton, in the self-assigned role of Sergeant Major, who was never going to be satisfied. I'd always been pretty critical of Brad in, in the way that I think that he approached things and he went about his business in the sense that he had this massive gift but was never going to fulfil his potential. And I think, you know, we all love the track. No one gets a buzz like I get from the track, but, you know, I saw this kid, you know, he, he had... If you can go that fast around the track, 
you know, in an individual pursuit, you have got the hallmarks of going very well in time trials on the road, etc. But I think Brad just never trained. And, you know, he, much as he might hate me saying that, we never saw the real Brad Wiggins at any Olympic Games to date. You know, we've seen, uh, ex you know, all these medals from him and everything else, but we never saw the real Brad Wiggins. You know, if we were to see Brad Wiggins today dedicate himself to the track the way he's applied himself to this project on the road, there'd be records laid down now that no one would be able to touch. Bradley Wiggins had won it all. Team and individual pursuits, Madison's, it mattered little. Track cycling had brought him success and fame. But all the while, another target was moving into sight. The road. His forays into the continental pro circuit had whetted his appetites. This was where his future now lay. Those years were for me really, I was getting limited success, so I was successful on the track, little prologues here and there on the road, and, and that was enough for me at that time in my life really. I think as I've got older I've wanted more, I've uh, you know, kind of realised what I'm capable of doing, and a lot of it is about fulfilling potential really, which I did on the track, um, but I always felt I could do it on the road, and I loved the kind of the, the romance with the road really as well, a lot of these races, you know, to, to lead something like Paris-Nice or ride Roubaix and come onto that velodrome and those kind of things. So I always wanted that and I never had that, so it's nice to be able to, to be doing those kind of things now. If you've got pursuit speed, then I've, I think you could take it a stage further. And if you look back through history, you'll find probably that a lot of these great tour riders have this astonishing uh, background of being able to ride uh, well on the track as well. I mean, Eddie Merckx, for instance, he broke the hour record, and of course he is uh, the man that won all the tours. Early flirtations with the professional road scene had not been particularly rewarding, but by 2006, in the famous red of the prestigious French team Cofidis, he wrote his first Tour de France, finishing in a no more than modest 124th. A year later, things had moved on significantly. Now married to Kath and a new father, his growing status within the team had seen him rewarded with an improved contract. Moreover, in 2007, the Tour came to London. The stir is created, you know, the Tour de France and uh... You know, if, if a couple of people out there can be inspired by it, then that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, it's great that we're talking about the Tour de France this year in such a positive aspect and a positive light after all the problems last year. Well, I think we can all agree with that. Bradley, good luck. We'll be watching you tomorrow. Here's Bradley Wiggins now. Look at the concentration. This is a big day for him. He'll never get a chance like this in his career. He knows that probably the vast majority of the crowd know this man. They're going to shout him around this course. He's got the gold, silver and bronze medals. The Queen gave him the order of the British Empire because of that. But I think he'd give them all back if he could win the prologue today. The stage was set for Wiggins, but there was unease too. The previous Tour de France had been ripped apart by doping scandals from start to finish. For Wiggins, a shadow had fallen over the sport, even if he hoped that 2007 would see the tour move on towards a cleaner future. My sport is finally getting its act together and we're starting to clamp down. Maybe never, we'll never clamp it fully out because there's always people that are willing to push the boundaries, but we're making massive progress and um, you know, I'm 100% confident we won't see the kind of stories we saw in Strasbourg last year at the Tour de France, this year at the Tour de France in London. On stage six, aware that it was the birthday of the late Tom Simpson, Wiggins rode out an emotional solo breakaway which saw him build up a 15-minute lead over the bunch before the inevitable catch. That day, for the first time, he stood on the podium of the Tour de France, the winner of the Daily Combativity Prize for the most aggressive rider. Bradley Wiggins, there he is on the left, as the field go around him, the man who has dictated the race 
has just been caught at four miles from the finish. He's led for 120 miles today. Does it really feel like you might have sort of come of age as a, as a race rider in the, uh, in, the, in the big road races now with that solo breakaway? Uh, I don't know, really. Someone had to do it, didn't they? And whoever does it sort of gets tagged with a sort of stupid hat, so I guess that was me today. But by the time the race reached the Pyrenees, his worst fears were realised. The nightmare of doping hit home. At the end of stage 16, his cofferdist teammate Christian Moraney was marched publicly away by the gendarmerie after a positive dope test. Back in Manchester, Wiggins reacted with revulsion and shock to the state of not only the tour, but road racing in general. We were locked in our rooms with police officers, uh, st our st stuff was searched and you know, it's reassuring to know that that's the length and the seriousness that the police take it out there in France. That if my wife's flight hadn't been booked to Paris, to come to Paris, I'd have climbed off and gone home. I just did not want to be part of that race anymore. I think the team managers have to take responsibility for this as well because they're willing to pay you know, these guys that are under suspicion and involved in previous years in, in doping scandals and that. You know, the last two years, my childhood dream, which became a reality, has been all over by certain members of the peloton. My role as an athlete and, you know, some people would say as an ambassador for the sport is, is to just go out there and, and continue plugging away and continue trying to win races clean. Wiggins returned to what he knew. The clean, hermetically sealed world of the track gave him the refuge he sought from the sprawling, corrupt road scene he felt he'd left behind him. Steve Peters refocused him again. I think one of the strengths of Bradley is that he is able to step outside of the situation and himself and do a reasonable self-appraisal. So he may speak emotionally and his emotions may have gotten down. The human within Bradley is quite stable and he can look onto this and recognise what his emotions are doing to him and that's a massive plus in an athlete. Whether he can then deal with it is another matter. But he works on that, so that's a skill base, and he's getting better and better. I don't think we do a lot, to be honest with you. I think we're just there. We, we give off um, a good vibe to the, to the staff here. You know, from a coaching point of view, if anyone needs a little help, we're there to, to advise as a head coach here. I see myself more of a father figure. And, you know, I do love him like a son. There's no two ways about it. I hurt when he's hurting. No one was ever providing these professionals with a service give them a support network, you know, that they can lean on, get their expertise from, and, and we're, we're taking them to another level. Here we go, right to the start line now for Team Garmin Slipstream here. And this is a big chance now for Bradley Wiggins, if he can get this team organised to do a great ride. 2008 was all about the Beijing Olympics, an unparalleled success for British cycling. But in 2009, Wiggins switched his attention back to the road. He knew that in order to win, he had to be more than a time trialist. He had to be able to climb with the best. He arrived at the Tour de France with a new team, a new physique, and a reinvigorated appetite for the road. I lived in France for a few years, so I kind of got a sort of a, a bit of a kind of an affinity with the French. You know, I do a lot of interviews in French, and I kind of love their passion for this great race and, and their sport in general in France. So I, I kind of, and I, I respect that in them. This sport, you, know, you, can, you can't fail to inspire someone at some point. It only takes one person to be inspired by something you do. And um, it's what they go on to do then that then one day say, well, actually, I was inspired by watching Brad Wiggins win Paris Nice or something. And those things are, you know, that's what this is all about ultimately. Now, what is Garmin going to deliver? It'll be a new best time here. Garmin Slipstream are now in, in 46-47. They've done what they can do. That's the best time on the board, and they've done it virtually the whole way with just five riders. It's about being good for 21 days and, and, and carrying out a process day in, day out for 21 days. And it is Bradley Wiggins who's driving up to the line. Well done, Bradley. This is a ride and a half for the Garmin Slipstream rider and never having any really bad days, never having any real exceptional days, but just being good. The face here of Bradley Wiggins, he's confirmed today that he is in this race to Paris and he is in the race for a high finish. He is one of the best riders in this league group and he's very, very strong indeed. And 
And that, I think ultimately that's what wins you the Tour de France. Bradley, you've got to ride your heart out now because you are holding fourth place by the skin of your racing shorts. His 2009 Tour de France smashed expectations. Climbing alongside the greatest stage racers of the age in Armstrong and Contador, he became a real contender, finishing fourth and equaling Robert Miller's all-time British Tour record. That summer, his value soared. His sudden elevation coincided with the launch of Team Sky, with the avowed public intention of winning the Tour de France with a British rider. Dave Brailsford, the guru behind GB cycling success, was recruiting aggressively. They needed Wiggins, but would they get him? Family man, someone waves a big check in front of you, and the team's British, what are you going to do? In the autumn of 2009, Dave Brailsford, the mastermind behind Britain's Beijing Gold Rush, was putting together the final pieces of the Team Sky jigsaw. New bus, new money, big ambitions. A tug of war ensued between Garmin and Sky. In the end, money talked and Wiggins, almost overnight, became a millionaire. And with the riches came the pressure. For the first time, Britain started to consider the prospect of a homegrown tour winner, and so, did Bradley Wiggins. This year I, I've sort of become more efficient to kind of go in longer on these sort of climbs and that's what I've prepared for more this year so it's not as if I'm much more powerful than last year I just can do it more often really. Climbing is a funny old thing you've either got it or you haven't really and you know you just have to have confidence in how you've prepared and you know power to weight is means everything when you're climbing for one hour. This is Bradley Wiggins, we need to look at his face, he's looking as though it's beginning to hurt. Well, it should be, it's nearly over, three and a half kilometres to go for the leaders. Wiggins started all the trouble today with his team, and he's lived up to it so far, but don't unhitch now, Bradley. But the hype was trumped by reality. From the drop of the flag, Wiggins' first tour with Team Sky fell flat. I got to the tour in belief that, you know, the people that were around Brad, it was going to be a good tour. And what we were seeing before our eyes and before we got the tour, we were doubting that we were getting the right information. But Wiggins is now gone. He's been slipped off the back of this group. The numbers and everything that we were getting from Brad in 2010 was, in layman's terms, Look at the gap as Wiggins hits the line. A minute and three quarters lost to the men he's trying to beat here. That's a serious loss when the day seemed to be going so well. Brad's all of a sudden come from earning like a reasonable salary, he's a good bike rider, you know, steady family life and everything else to becoming a megastar after in 2009. So, you know, all of a sudden he rocks up and, you know, you've got the likes of James Murdoch backing you. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, I'm the man. And I think he took that attitude and he was quite blasé about that, you know, but what he didn't look at was the hard work. There was a little bit of... Uh meltdown let's say for for a little while i'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that that uh, you know which way do you go and then so many so much expectations dumped on his shoulders uh yeah he's the leader of this team and this new team and they're going to do this and that and like you say the great white hope uh bloody hell it'd be it would be hard for anyone to cope with and i said to brad you know what are you doing you know he's laying home in bed and I just went absolutely nuts. Dave went, you know, Dave Brailsford went nuts about it. It wasn't, it wasn't acceptable. 2010 first race in Team Sky Colours. Um, I think there was two things going on, in my opinion. Uh, first of all, he was still in one of his, I'm kidding myself that this is the right way to go, uh, kind of thing. When the form, I think he was avoiding the hard training, uh, the losing the weight, the detail that was going to make the difference that he needed to do. Um, and the second is, they were trying to be too clever. They'd lost track of the fundamentals of to ride a bike fast and we're looking at the tiny details of a fantastic bus that I'd like to change colour and we're going to start you at the, the start of the day in the prologue rather than with everybody else at the end because the weather forecast says, you know. And they were really trying hard to... And they lost sight of the, the bigger picture because they were so fixed on the details. No one really knew how we're going to try and win the Tour de France. What did you do last year? Well, I did the Giro. Maybe that was what, what worked. So we went back and did the Giro the following year. Um, and then, obviously, had a disappointing tour, way below expectation, although finished 23rd. So it wasn't, it wasn't a complete disaster. There were some positives to take from it. 
But what it did was it, it gave us the sort of the tools and the initial stage to go, actually now, right, how are we going to make this motor work, this engine of yours? And that was where it was decided, well, Tim Kerrison, Shane Sutton, they're going to look after me. And that's where the, you know, Tim, Tim had been following the team around for a year, come from swimming, so knew nothing about cycling, but knew about endurance training and how to train the body to be really good at something. The, the first step in that was analysing the demands of the Tour de France, really having a look at what it takes to win the Tour de France. For, and in reference to Brad, as the leader, as the GC rider. In 2010, we got to watch Brad um, ride the tour, you know, up close and personal. And it was a challenging tour in several regards. And we got to see where Brad didn't quite uh, meet the demands of the event. And there were a couple of things in particular. You know, we know that Brad's a fantastic time trialer and always has been. But the two, uh, two of the key performance criteria for the tour are to be able to time trial and climb. And it was a bit, of a bit out of balance there. He wasn't climbing as well as he was time trialling. So for, for a start, we recognised we needed to continue to develop his climbing. We can talk about science and we can get Tim in here and we can go for every number. You know, we can give you his two minute power, you know, right through to whatever you want to 459 average for the Worlds last year to 492 in, um, you know, the prologue last week, whatever. We can give you all the science behind everything else. But it's like anything, I think. I think, and it amazes me in sport when I watch Sky, you know, the football on Sky, and they say, oh, it's on his left peg. Unlucky. You know, if you're being paid that amount of money and you've only got two feet and you can't kick with the other one, you're doing something wrong. And I think, you know, this is exactly with Bradley, you know, we've gone away and we've trained every area that you need to train as an athlete. It's just making sure he trains. That's the science. There's a reaction from Wiggins here. He's on the attack. Between Shane and myself, met with Brad, talked about, you know, this is what we think it's going to take to move you on. And over the next uh, few months, we started to put together a program. Brad committed to it 100%. I'm not sure at that stage we necessarily were 100% believed that um, we could move on far enough to win the Tour de France, but we were certainly going to give it a crack. Whatever the reason for his failure in 2010, the message got through that things had to change. Wiggins started to train harder than he had ever done before, banishing the complacency of the previous year. And out on the road, it was starting to show. In 2011, he won the Dauphiné, his first major stage race, and then he followed that up by winning the Great Britain National Road Race Championship. Bradley Wiggins wins in emphatic style. Shane Sutton and Tim Kerrison have worked wonders this year for me and you know we had a plan this year, a training plan and it's you know we are a week out from the tour and it's if I'm ever going to do something special other than what I did in 2009 I certainly feel twice the bike ride I did then so um, yeah just enjoy it now really. When Team Sky arrived at the start of the Tour de France in 2011, they were all confident that Wiggins was in the form of his life. It's obviously a very, very demanding sport in competition. And to prepare for that, the training has to be very, very demanding as well. Not only to get the body into absolute peak shape, but also to create a robust athlete that we know is going to survive three weeks, that both physically and mentally and maintain a high level of performance day in, day out, can't afford to have a bad day. And I think Brad will say now that, that he recovers very, very quickly. He has more explosiveness, he can respond to attacks much better, but then he can come back to an intensity that most riders couldn't sustain for more than a couple of minutes, and he can come back to that, that intensity, sustain it for, you know, for half an hour, and actually be recovering. So they're the sorts of things that we've built into training. Um, to, to ensure that Bradley can respond to any situation that's thrown to him. What might have happened will remain a matter of conjecture, though. Fate, as it often does on the tour, had other plans for Bradley Wiggins. We're going to start to see some very high speeds now, because there, oh, there's another crash that's a race radio there's telling me it's a crash. crash oh, dear. Right down, Bradley.
Guys, it's over for Bradley, okay? He's got a broken collarbone. It looked like you knew straight away. I mean, it looked fairly clear from the pictures. Did, yeah. did it feel like that on the ground? So yeah, speak? I couldn't get up off the floor for love nor money. And, uh, you know, once I did make it to the side of the road, I kind of kept saying, I just want to get back on the bike, want to get back on the bike. And um, But there comes a point where, you know, you can't, you just can't do it really, so. But I feel top of the world now. I've had some fantastic drugs in there and they've... I feel fabulous now, so... At what, at what yeah. point does it sink in? What, what, you know, what's happened to you? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's bike racing, isn't it? You know, he's just... I'm gibbering now, but uh, it's unfortunate, but, you know, life goes on. It's only bike racing in today, and I've got fantastic form, and it's only a break, collarbone, so, uh, you know, I'll uh, recover from it and be back for the end of the season, I'm sure, so... In his younger days, a blow like that might have derailed him. Not this time. Within weeks, he was back in training, keeping himself at a peak of condition, which he showed the world at the first available opportunity. The Vuelta, the Tour of Spain. A brutal three-week stage race, which Bradley Wiggins and Team Sky took by the scruff of the neck. Wiggins finished third overall, while his teammate, the astonishing Chris Froome, came second. An amazing result and uncharted territory for British riders in a grand tour as clear a signal as possible had been sent to all his rivals. I worked hard in the gym this winter um, to inc increase my strength core-wise. Uh, I had to strengthen my shoulder again after last year crashing, so that was, a, they, that was all towards being stronger this year. So all those things have contributed to being more powerful, stronger this year. With that comes a little bit more weight, but um, if, it, if it propels you forward further, then it's obviously worth carrying that weight. And so to 2012. His preparation for the Tour was as close to perfection as it's possible to get. He won Paris-Nice, the prestigious early season stage race. He won the testing Tour of Romandy, winning a sprint. He won the pre-Tour litmus test, the Criterium du Dauphiné, for a second consecutive year. No one has won Romandy and the Dauphiné in the same year and not gone on to win the Tour de France. Bradley Wiggins goes out, the winner of the general classification for the second time. Looking, no doubt now, towards the Tour de France, the big objective of the season. But what a year it's been so far. It's not a surprise. It's what we've worked towards. So all the training, all the sacrifice, all the kind of going up to training, high altitude and training and, and the, you know, testing sessions that Tim's devised and that have all been towards being... To the, towards the demands of what the tour is about. So when we go out and we're close to the tour in something like the Dauphiné and all the work we've been doing now for the last 18 months is starting to come better all the time, that's more of a relief and a, and a satisfaction that actually that was certainly worth it, all that, all that time and effort. Without doubt, going into the 2012 tour, we have a much, much more complete athlete, a more robust athlete, an athlete who is prepared mentally and physically for the for the rigours of a of a three week stage race. The good thing is we've got him back to try and grasp the opportunity again, but he, in an even better place. And as I say, for me, it 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 it, it means masses as seeing, you know, your boy achieve something. Bradley Wiggins uh, bows his head to the crowd on top of a mountain in the middle of the Haute-Saône region of France. He pulls on the maillot jaune. I'm in the yellow jersey in the tour, and that's something to be savoured today and enjoy, you know, because as I said earlier, that was uh, it's been a childhood dream of mine, and here I am now, so yeah. The process we've been through, I think there, there's no aspect of our preparation that we feel we're, we're not good enough in. The thought of an Englishman winning the Tour de France it was just something, well, you would dream of and hope one day, but somehow or other you never thought it would happen. So for him to achieve that, that would be the greatest achievement that you could ever imagine. I think Bradley knows that he's in a very good place physically. The, the only thing that I would guess, I'm sure you won't mind me saying it, is he won't want to let people down. That's the only pressure he will feel. Wiggins comes all the way home now. This is going to be the time of the day. The stage victory will be for him. His first ever in the Tour de France. He's in yellow, Paul. He's going to increase his lead tonight as he wins the stage. I love this race. I love this sport. And um, it's just moments like that, that to make all the hard work worthwhile. If he does it, I think I'll 
take all, I'll get all my family and we'll all go out and um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'm going to celebrate. <laughs> I'm going to celebrate in a big way. We haven't really planned after 1st of August, but I don't see any reason why short break and we get back on, on it and try and do it all again next year. There's always another challenge in cycling and you know everyone lives for the moment, but as I've realised with previous successes, life carries on and there's always something else to go for and it doesn't just stop there and 